All right, 1 Samuel chapter 17, we've made our way down to verse 31, so I will ask you to get your eyes into uh, that particular passage beginning in chapter 17, verse 31. This is the scene with David and Goliath. This is one that uh, if you've been around the church for a lengthy period of time, if you grew up and your parents brought you to Bible class, vacation Bible school and things like that, you grew up hearing about David and Goliath. It is an exciting history. It is wonderful in the courage and faith of young David. He is the youngest of his brothers. There are eight of them all together. And David's the very youngest. And he's been out tending sheep. And his father has sent him to the battle lines. He has three older brothers who are with King Saul. And they faced off. There's a valley between them and the Philistines. And for over a month, 40 days, the giant named Goliath has come out morning and evening into that valley of Elah. And he has been sounding forth a challenge. And he is asking for one champion to come meet him in the valley. And if he beats the giant, Goliath promises the Philistines will become servants to the Israelites. But if Goliath beats the Israelite champion, the Israelite champion then Israelites were to become their servants. There wouldn't be any need for a battle of the whole army on each side. Well, no one's met the challenge. And now David's there, <clears throat> and he hears the challenge of the giant. Verse 31, When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. Now the words that he'd been saying, if you look back at verse 26, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? That that would come to the ears of King Saul is telling me something. Nobody else is talking like that. Nobody else is speaking that way. Nobody else has that confidence in God, that courage in God. Nobody's sounding out like that. This is a new word. This is something that hasn't been heard among the Israelites. And so it comes to the ears of King Saul. And David said to Saul in verse 32, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Nobody else dared. Nobody else wanted to. Nobody else volunteered. They wouldn't do it out of noble cause because he was taunting the armies of the living God, because he was taunting God himself. They wouldn't do it for that reason. And so the king's offering riches and marriage into his family and that whoever beats him, well, that one's father's household will be free in Israel so he's offering a bounty with it, and still there's no takers. And now David sounds forth this way, and they go tell Saul, there's one voice in the whole army. There's one voice. And Saul calls David to see who he is and what he's about. When we say things, our word gets around. One of the things that is a mistake is to think that we can say things and it won't get around. Nobody's going to hear about it. Everybody does. Everybody hears about it. You keep your secret. It'll get around. You tell one person, it'll get around. That's just the way it is. Somebody else knows about it. It's going to, it's going to get around. And it got all the way around to the ears of King Saul and so he calls David and now are his words going to be backed up with action? When we say things, are our words worthy to be backed up? Do they glorify self or do they glorify God? And so now there's an audience with King Saul. Verse 33, 
Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth, while he's been a warrior from his youth. You, you can't do it. There's no way in the world that you can do it. That's his first impression of David. But eventually, he's going to let him try. And I want you to think about this. Why does he let him try? David responds in a way that convinces Saul to let him try. I know I'm, uh, I'm getting older and I'm running out of illustrations because I've been in the same place for a while. And I, I mentioned this to you before. This was way back at the very first place I ever preached full time. Our brother-in-law and Gwen's sister attended there with us for a while, and Kevin, my brother-in-law, he, he used to like cars, but he didn't have new cars. He had older cars, but they were muscle cars. He liked things like Trans Ams and Dodge Chargers and things like that. Well, he had one of those, and it was either... A, Trans Am Z28 style car, something like that, but it was older, didn't have good paint on it, had a few dings on it, but it had the muscle under the hood, so he was proud of it. And there we were after services on a Sunday morning, and we were just outside the little white church building there, and, and uh, there were a couple boys, brothers, and they were at a gangly age. You know what I mean? That... 10 to 12 years old where they haven't quite got all their coordination figured out and their legs get in the way. And, uh, and so one of those boys, for some reason, I can't remember what the conversation was, he said to Kevin, he said uh, he could jump his car. He could jump from this fender across the hood and make it to the other side. And, uh, and Kevin looked at him and he said, go ahead. Now, we, we didn't think it could be done. So that boy backed up, and he got a good running start, and he just piled up into the fender and laid down by the front wheel. And because he didn't hurt anything but his pride, we just had a good laugh over it. Well, David comes up, and he tells Saul, don't let anybody's heart fail because of this guy. I'll go out there and fight him. And the first thing Saul said was, you're not able to do that. He's been a warrior since his youth. You're still in your youth. You, you've been tending sheep. You don't know anything about this. And David said something to convince him otherwise. Are you going to, are you going to let the first impressions of other people, their low expectations of you, define your life? And you know what? You may pile up into a fender the first time you try. But are you going to let other people determine what you can and can't do? Or are you going to do what God tells you you can do? Are you going to achieve what God has designed for you to achieve? So Saul's going to let him do that. And David's not about to listen to the voices of the rest of the army because they're not doing anything. I want you to think about when the spies came back from spying out Canaan and they convinced everybody, they just, they just spent all this time traveling from Egypt across the wilderness up to the land of Canaan and the spies come back and they say, you can't do it. And so they ended up wandering in the wilderness 40 years. So the Israelites couldn't take Canaan because somebody said so. <clears throat> and when Jesus asked Philip, about how to feed the 5,000, Philip said it couldn't be done. But it could be done. Peter determined, after a few steps, he couldn't walk on water. And he began to sink, but he could walk on water if Jesus told him he could. There's a lot of things that we determine out of fear can't be done, that should be done, that God wants us to do, we could do if we didn't listen to the voices around us and sometimes the voice in our own mind. What's the real problem? It's the limitations that we put on ourselves. And the limitations we put on ourselves begins to limit our God. If God's Word tells you to do something, do it. Don't be afraid of it. It might be big. 
But if God tells you to do it, well, just do it. And don't listen to the voices around you. Don't look at what everybody else is doing. Don't let that deter you from it. Step out in faith like David did. Now, David begins to reason in verse 34. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. Would you rather? Barehanded. Would you rather fight a lion, fight a bear, or fight a man? If you say you'd rather fight a lion or a bear, you don't know what a lion and bear can do. They want to eat you. And they are built to do just that. And the strength of a lion and a bear is no match for a man in any way, shape, or form. So would you rather? Well, David's looking at this as, I've already fought the lion. I've already fought the bear. This is just a man. But I want you to look further at how he reasons. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him, rescued it from his mouth, and when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. So when David overcame the lion, and when David overcame the bear, how did he do it? What was his thinking? Who did he give credit to? Was it his own fighting ability? Was it his own strength? Was it his own ingenuity? What was it? Well, he assigns it to God. God allowed him to be able to do that. When humanly, that should not have been able to have been done. And now he looks at this man who's taunting God and the army of God, and he's saying, look, God already delivered the lion and the bear, and this guy's no different. He's just a brute beast. And God's going to enable me to do this, because there's a reason. And so that's, that's the way he talks to Saul, and Saul hears that, and no one else is talking that way. The Spirit of God has left Saul. And there's nobody else like this in the whole army. Now I want you to imagine he's got these three older brothers. Eliab's already chewed him out once. He's got his three older brothers there, and his three older brothers are thinking that their youngest brother is going out to die that day. That's their thought process. They wouldn't challenge even though they're the three oldest, they wouldn't challenge Goliath. They've got to be thinking, David's going to die today. This is the end of this. And David's ready to go out. Now, verses uh, 38 through 40. Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with his armor. Whose bronze helmet and armor is he wearing? Does it tell us? He dressed David in his own tunic. Whose helmet? Whose armor? I don't know that we can conclude that that was Saul's. The tunic? The undergarments? Yes. But whose armor? Now let me ask you this. How big was Saul? I'm just, I'm just saying, think about that. I'm not even sure that would even 
fit. Because Saul was head and shoulders above everybody. I've, uh, I've tried to wear some things before, like uh, a hat, going to the store, and I've thought, about, I've thought about buying a hat before. And I've gone into a store, and I thought, well, I wonder if this hat would fit. And I put it on, and it goes, whew, it just spins around. I'm not sure that David could put on his actual armor. But Saul furnished him with a helmet. He furnished him with armor. He furnished him with a sword. He was ready for battle as you would normally think of a soldier. He did wear Saul's garments. But I'm not sure about the rest of it. If he just furnished him something that would fit him or if it was Saul's. So leave that one with a question mark because I don't know that we can know that for sure by the description that's given there. And then David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he'd not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I've not tested them. And David took them off. Just wasn't, if, if you've never worn armor, if you've never worn that kind of stuff, how are you going to function in it? I don't know. I've never been a soldier. I don't know anything about it. I don't know what I'm talking about. All I know is what I see in the movies. In the movies, and maybe I'm all wet on this, I don't know, but they go to their training in the movies, and they have them wear what they would wear if they were out on the battlefield, and they have them running that stuff. They have them practicing in that stuff. So they know the weight, and they know the balance, and they know what it feels like, and they get used to carrying the extra weight and how to function in that. Can you imagine never having anything like that before and putting on armor, putting on a helmet, putting on the you know, guards around your legs and trying to walk around and function in that? You've never carried such a thing before and don't know how to balance with it all? And David said, I can't do it. I remember a, a preacher, and I borrowed this a time or two, uh, he, he, uh, he preached a really good sermon, and one of, the, one of the boys in the congregation asked him for a copy of his sermon notes after. He said, can I have your sermon notes? And he just looked at him and grinned and said, that'd be like putting a shotgun shell in a BB gun. David didn't, didn't know how to handle that stuff. He wasn't used to it. So, verse 40, he took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even his pouch, and his sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine with a stick, a bag of stones, and a sling. And that's what he came before Goliath with. I want you to think about this armor. And if I were to ask you a question, I want you to think about your answer. Can you wear somebody else's armor that you've not trained in? And then, what is our armor today? How would you describe it? What passage would you turn to in the New Testament about the Christian armor? What book are we in? Ephesians chapter 6, begin about verse 10. And you'll read down through there about a very different kind of armor because our battle is not against flesh and blood. It has to do with spiritual struggle in heavenly places. And I think about the book of Job with that, where he knew nothing about what was going on in the heavenly realm between God and Satan and the accusations and all that was going on there. But Ephesians 6 expands on that idea. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. The things that we war with are not like that. There's another passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, very similar to it. That's not our battle. And then he goes on in Ephesians 6 to describe our armor, our sword, our shield. And the sword is the word of God, and the shield of faith, and so on and so forth. Now, the armor 
is going to be somewhat the same for all of us. Just like the army of the Israelites, they all would have a shield. They all would have a sword. They all would have you know, similar things, but it fit them personally, each one of them. Can you wear somebody else's armor? And the answer is you cannot. You can't wear somebody else's armor. You have to have your own. Hebrews 5, verse 14. Solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You have to practice with the armor. We might all have a sword. The sword in Ephesians 6 is the Word of God. All right, we've all got a sword. But your sword might be a different sharpness. Your sword might be a different size. Some have learned more of the Word of God than other people have. Some know because they've trained with it and discerned with it, they know where to go in the Bible to answer certain questions. You can't wear somebody else's armor. Somebody's shield of faith might be larger or sturdier than somebody else's. But you can't wear somebody else's armor. You can't wear your mom and dad's armor. You need to develop your own. You can't wear the preacher's armor. You've got to develop your own. Sometimes people are accustomed to running to someone else. Here, here is some... Bible question that comes up and they want to go over here and borrow somebody else's sword and somebody else's shield and come back here to the battle and use their sword and shield. And they might come back with what this person told them, but they don't understand it. And they come back and they quote the verse, but they don't know the context. They don't understand the meaning. And so they give the answer and the person asks them a question about it now they're lost again. They've got to run back and borrow somebody else's sword and shield. We each need to develop our own. You're going to notice that David went into the battle with what he knew how to use. So you know some Bible. You can defend the faith to a certain degree. You know certain things. Use those. You will expand, you will grow, you will learn every day of your life. Your faith will mature and grow and, and your armor will begin to mature in that way. But take into the battle what you know how to use. And that's what David did. When I was a brand new preacher, just coming out of preaching school, and it was a daunting task to think about, I'm being assigned a Sunday morning sermon, a Sunday night sermon, a Sunday morning Bible class, a Wednesday night Bible class, and I'm just starting out, where do all the ideas come from? Have you ever wondered about that? Where do all the ideas come from? Where do you formulate all that? How do you develop all of that? Where does it come from? And so like a lot of young preachers, I filled a shelf or two in my office of sermon outline books because I was looking for ideas. I don't know what to think next. I don't know what the next lesson's going to be. So you get these sermon outline books, and they were always clunky. They never fit. They just didn't come out right. And people who were listening to it would listen to it and go, I think he got that from somebody else. Because it didn't sound like me. And, uh, and so they were a clunky thing to work with. Now I think maybe, I don't, I don't even know if I have any of those left. I think I ended up throwing them all out one day. And, uh, but they filled my shelf and I just stopped looking at them just didn't look at them anymore. I might still have some. I don't know if I do or not. But that's what happens when you try to use somebody else's armor. It's a clunky fit. It just doesn't come out right. It doesn't work right. It doesn't fit. 
So David takes what he knows and he goes into battle. Now we begin in verse 41. Any comments before we do that? Verse 41 and 42. Then the Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. Anybody have a word besides disdained? He, he was just disgusted. He was just disgusted with him, disappointed. Like, this is it? This is what they're sending out? Here's a boy with a stick. And this is what they send out to me? And that's kind of what he tells him. Well, the Philistine looked and saw David, and he disdained him. For, because, he was but a youth and ruddy and with a handsome appearance. And then the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come out to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So this is the beginning of this. And he, he didn't like him, one, because of his youth, two, because he was ruddy, and three, because he was handsome. Have you ever, um, and I don't, know, I don't know if this is the meaning of the text or not, but I'll mention it for whatever it's worth. If you're ever, if you're ever around somebody and there's some kind of a confrontation coming up and you look at them and their ears are all matted up and cauliflowered out, stay away from that. Just go the other direction. That's someone who's been in some battles. That's someone who's been in a lot of fights. And their ears get all scarred up. When you see someone like that, just kind of go the other way. And don't get involved in that. I would have to imagine that if this guy's been a warrior from his youth, that he has some battle scars. And here comes out this fresh young kid, not a mark on him. He still looks good. He's handsome. Ruddy would have to do with a certain kind of complexion. And you've seen it. You've seen some. They, you can tell they're young. They have this complexion to them, maybe a little rosiness in their cheeks, and this young skin and... You look at them and you go, man, how old are you? Because there's, the people don't ask me that that way anymore. They say, how old are you? But when you see someone young like that and it surprises you, maybe they're in the position they're in or something like that, how old are you? It's because they're young and their complexion is a certain type and you don't think they're old enough to be there. But they are. And so David is young He's inexperienced, he's got that complexion, he's good looking, and the Philistines said, what am I, a dog? You send, you send this out to me? This is my challenge, this is it, and that's all there is. And then verse uh, 44, the Philistine said to David, come to me. And I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands. I'll strike you down, remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. The battle is the Lord's. It'd be kind of cool if somebody made a song out of that. The battle belongs to the Lord comes from passages like that. And so that's the word of David compared to the word of Goliath. Goliath, verse 43, he's defending his own honor. David is defending the honor of God. He comes in the name of the Lord. He's going to teach the Israelites something about God. He's going to teach the Philistines something about God. 
God's the one who strengthens me. And so he is challenging for a very different reason. Verse 47 is a major lesson for us. We need to know the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. That's not how the Lord delivers. That is not the strength of the Lord. If we're waiting until we're mature enough, until we know enough, until we learn enough, until the congregation's big enough, until we have this, until we have that. Let's look at the bank account. Let's look at this. And until all of this stuff gels together, we're not going to be able to do anything. The Lord doesn't deliver by sword and spear. He doesn't deliver through materialism. He doesn't deliver through the arm of the flesh. That's not how the Lord wins. He can deliver by many or by few. The battle is the Lord's. Just do what He says, and the Lord will win. So this is the challenge from Goliath, the challenge from David, and we need to think about how big God is in our own mind. How big is your God? What can't you do that He tells you to do? When you come across a passage in the Bible and you say, I see it, I read it, I understand it, I believe it, but I can't do it. How big is God in your mind? What can't you do that He demands that you do? We should not think in just physical, material terms. And consider what part prayer plays in all of this. When we pray... Is that just a moment of meditation? When we pray, is that just to comfort our emotions? When we pray, does anything happen in the heavenly realm? When we pray, does God listen and take action in whatever way He puts that into motion, using angels in some way as ministering spirits to those who would be heirs of salvation, Hebrews 1.14. However God puts prayer into motion, when we pray, it's not just meditation. It's not just to give us a comfortable place in our emotions. It activates something in the heavenly realm when we pray according to His will. Consider what part prayer plays in all of that. In verse 48, then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David. David ran quickly to the battle line. He didn't draw back a step. He didn't see this giant coming at him and start backpedaling. He went forward to meet him. There's something really magnificent in the way David's approaching this. Remember, our battles are of, a, are of a different sort today. And I would suggest again that you read Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, and also 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. We walk in the flesh, but we do not war according to the flesh. And as 2 Corinthians 10 goes on, it talks about how that we are setting out to destroy fortresses. But those fortresses are the thoughts, the imaginations, the speculations, the faulty logic of human minds. And through God's truth, we set those in right order and move people's thinking toward God instead of where they've been lost in sin. <clears throat> we shouldn't avoid the confrontations. Why aren't more souls won. Why aren't there more Bible studies that are happening? I like online resources like Apologetics Press or Focus Press or Christian Courier. I like those kinds of things because they run to the battle line and you'll find a number of them in the Brotherhood they run to the battle line. They run to the challenge. And some of it looks so gigantic to us. I have no idea how to face off against this 
atheism, evolution. I don't know what to do with it. I like those kinds of resources because they run to the battle line and they take the challenge and they need to be things that we gravitate toward. Verses 48 through 51. Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag, took from it a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and took and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Question. How did David kill Goliath? Did he kill him with a stone? If you look at that, it appears as though he stunned him and dropped him with a stone. And he did kill him, verse 50 is more of a summary of how it all went. But he actually took the giant's sword and killed him with the sword. Is that the way your Bible reads? Who has a different reading there? Okay, I want you to look at it this way. Verse 48, the Philistine rose, came and drew near to meet David. David ran quickly toward the battle line. Verse 49, David put his hand into his bag. He takes out the stone. He slings it. He strikes the Philistine on his forehead. It sank into his forehead, so he fell on his face to the ground. Thus, now look at verse 50. Here is a summary. Here is how it ended up. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. He did prevail over him with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him. How did he strike him and kill him? He prevailed over him with a sling and a stone. He dropped him with it. He struck him and he killed him. How did he strike him and kill him? But there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him. There's your homework. You have a very different reading. Sort through that. Is the NIV correct in the way it summarizes that? What about other Bible translations? What I'd like you to do is to lay all your translations, get four or five of them out. You can do it online if you don't have them in, in hard cover form. Do as much research on that as you can. Did he kill him with a sling and a stone? Or did he kill him with a giant sword? So you have something to look at for next week. And I want you to decipher through that and see what you can find out with it. Well, let me, let me put it this way. It's not necessarily a death blow. And I know that because my dad told me a story about a guy he used to hang around with, and he was a big guy, and he wore a big ring. And he hit a guy one time and left the imprint of the ring in his forehead. It sunk in, but he didn't kill him. So that's not necessarily a death blow because it said it stuck there. It left an imprint. It indented in him. That's not necessarily a death blow. Many people have been struck in the head 
and even had to have a plate put in their head to fill a gap. Not necessarily a death blow. Let's see what else we can find out about it. That's our second buzzer. You have some homework for next week. I want you to see what you determine with that. We'll come back and talk about that. And we have just about uh, 10 minutes to finish up this lesson, and we'll hand out a new one next week. Appreciate your attention, and uh, anxious to see what you find out. We are dismissed from class. Thank you.